before you become an entrepreneur, if you're asking yourself, are you ready to be an entrepreneur? You can almost run a mental A-B test with whatever work environment you're in at that moment. So if you're working for a company, if I was working for Cisco, I could say, you know, there's a certain set of things I'm responsible for. But what if I had my boss's job? What if I had my boss's boss's job? What if I was the CEO of Cisco? Every decision that they're making, what decision would I make if I were them? What information would I look for? What environment would I create? Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. This episode is powered by Jay Ventures, a community-driven VC fund in Silicon Valley in partnership with Leumi Tech, sponsored by Hippo Insurance, Opwest Labs, Turing, Hillel at Stanford, Leap, and in media partnership with C-Tech. Welcome to another episode of 20 Minute Leaders. Today, I'm honored with Raj Dedata, co-founder and CEO of Bloomreach. Raj Dedata is the co-founder and CEO of Bloomreach, a leading software platform for digital commerce experiences that powers brands representing 25% of retail e-commerce in the US and the UK. Raj is a multiple-time entrepreneur, before launching Bloomreach, he was entrepreneur in residence at Mordavido Ventures, served as Cisco's director of product marketing, and was on the founding team of telecom company First Mark Communications. Raj serves on the Council for Player Development for the U.S. Tennis Association, as a founder partner at Seed Stage Venture Capital from Founder Collective, and an individual investor in over 20 startups. He holds a BS in electrical engineering with a certificate in public policy and international affairs from Princeton University and an MBA with distinction from Harvard Business School. Raj Dedada, welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. I'm so honored to have you here. Thank you for taking time out of your business schedule to be here with me. How are you doing? Michael, it's great to be here with you. I'm doing great. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy we're on to summer here in uh, California. Wonderful. Uh, Raj, you know, when I, when I thought and prepared for what we're going to talk about, it was very hard for me because there are so many things that I want to pick your brain on, uh, so many amazing things that you've done, uh, both either from the venture capital perspective, the entrepreneurial perspective, uh, an advisory perspective, and now from an e-commerce and leadership perspective that, you know, I'm going to do my best over these 20 minutes to, to satisfy my, my thirst for, for, for the knowledge here. And so, so I'll, I'll do my best, but Raj, uh, just, you know, uh, briefly, co-founder and CEO of, of Bloomreach, uh, something that I'm personally really excited to hear more about uh, on the Council for Player Development for the U.S. Tennis Association. Uh, you were also a, a founding, founding partner of the Founder Collective. Uh, you did both Princeton University and Harvard Business School, uh, Cisco's Director of Product Marketing, uh, an entrepreneur as well. And so it's way too many things to cover, but Raj, Take me back to, to entrepreneurial experiences. That, that, it yeah. sounds like that's an innately part of you. Absolutely. So, you know, at age 21, right after I finished college, uh, you know, I was, I was working first at a, at a research institution, Bell Labs, uh, on the East Coast, and then later on on Wall Street. And I was going to go back to business school. And I met, you know, two individuals who said they were interested in starting a telecommunications business in Europe. And would I be interested in joining them? And so without ever having been to Europe, which is where the business was based, I picked up and moved to Europe, uh, got, wow. to, uh, got to Paris where I never, I didn't speak any French, realized it was impossible to get the business off the ground there, got on the train and moved to London and set up really the first business that I was involved in starting at, at 21 years old. And it was a broadband wow. teleservices business in Europe. And it was just a fantastic experience to go through young in one's career mostly because I really didn't know what I was doing. And yet, at the end of that three-year stint or three and a half years that I did that, I was totally convinced that I wanted to spend my life being an entrepreneur. And so maybe the greatest gift I got early was having clarity about what not to try to pursue and what to pursue. Tell me a little bit more about that clarity. You know, a lot of young entrepreneurs, including myself, are here listening to this and you know, one of the things that I'm really passionate in hearing is, is finding that clarity. What was it about that entrepreneurial experience at 21, hopping on a train, moving from different locations that told you, Raj, that this, this is your mission? This is what's going to make you happy? Well, there were a couple of things that happened in that venture. The first was, you know, the people that I was partnered with were 20 years older and they put in a little bit of capital. And so I assumed they knew what they were doing. And actually what I found was they didn't know a whole lot more than I, I knew at that time. And so I, you know, I realized hey, if, if I'm going to trust anybody's bad judgment, it may as well be my own. So that was the first. Uh, 
The second, the second thing, you know, that happened through that venture is the venture was, I would say it was mildly successful, but it was not crazy successful. And so, it, but at the end of it, I just love the work. I love the creation. I love the challenge. I love the effort. And I just couldn't get out of, out of my head. And I thought to myself, well, if it's not a great success and I still love it, that's a sign of something that you really want to do with your life. Right. And so following that entrepreneurial experience, you actually, found, you, you know, if you look through the journey, you, it's not like you then went on and dedicated your life to start to doing a startup after startup. You actually found your position in, in different leadership positions at, at various stages of the ecosystem, whether it's in venture capital or, or advising or working for a company like Cisco as director of product marketing. What, what was that about? What was the rationale for you? Yeah, so in those actually, journeys? You know, I was. I was living in London. I, uh, it was the, it was a recession, which was, you know, 2001 to 2003. And, and I wanted to come back to the U S. So I came back to business school in the U S. And then, uh, I actually was moving out to Silicon Valley to start a company. And I got an offer from Cisco to roll up my little venture into Cisco. And that's really how I became director of product marketing at Cisco was accidentally in that process. And, uh, and I was really involved in, in building a new venture within Cisco. Uh, and so it was really an entrepreneurial effort, just mostly done within the walls of Cisco. And that was great too. And mostly that what was great about that is I got to see scale. I got to see what it was like for the nice. CEO of Cisco to build something great, to communicate, to build culture, to drive things into the market, things that I never learned on my own as an entrepreneur at 21. And so it was still a very different kind of entrepreneurial experience. And that then took me to Hey, I, I was only at a venture capital firm for a few months thinking of the next new idea to start. So really, you know, I would say over 20 years, I've really been an entrepreneur three times. First in my first venture at 21, second, you know, uh, in an early venture that was acquired by Cisco. And then the third was, was the company that I'm involved in right now, Bloomreach. That leap from entrepreneur 21, then business school, Cisco, director of product marketing, scale one of the biggest and most amazing companies in the world. What was that like from, you know, an, an internal perspective? What, what was that leap like for you? Yeah, you know, it was actually pretty hard, I would say, because I was so used to kind of doing things on my own, that coordinating with tens of thousands of other people and the go-to-market organization. It was, I would say it was incredibly satisfying when we were building the products. Then when we had to take it out to market, it involved coordinating with thousands of salespeople and marketing people and who were selling wow. lots of products. And so it was a great learning experience, but I also have to say I didn't love it towards the end of my tenure at Cisco, and it reconvinced me to leave and get back, you know, uh, you know on on my uh, to my entrepreneurial roots. Right now, are there things that I, as a young entrepreneur, for example, can can do to prepare mentally, or or you know, grow maturely? You know, because you know, in today's world, we navigate back and forth, and it's becoming more and more frequent. So, what are things that young entrepreneurs, perhaps from your experience, you learned that you know that I can do for myself to to even begin playing that thought simulation forward? Well, I think that's a great question, and and indeed, I, I the way I I think about it is that before you become an entrepreneur, if you're asking yourself, are you ready to be an entrepreneur, you can almost run a mental A B test with whatever work environment you're in at that moment. So. If you're working for a company, if I was working for Cisco, I could say, you know, there's a certain set of things I'm responsible for. But what if I had my boss's job? What if I had my boss's boss's job? What if I was the CEO of Cisco? Every decision that they're making, what decision would I make if I were them? What information would I look for? What environment would I create? What choice would I make on a competitive basis? What markets would I enter? So basically, you can almost simulate in your mind as if you're the leader of the company. And, and, and then ask all the questions that you know that that leader is confronting and see what conclusions you come to. And then watch over the period of time what they do, how it plays out in comparison to what you decided in your own mind. And when you run that A-B test, you'll come to one of two conclusions. Well, you'll either decide it's really hard for you to make those choices, in which case you're probably not well-suited to be an entrepreneur because at the end of the day, you only have your own judgment. Or you'll decide, actually, you trust your gut. It's pretty good. You know, you have a good sense for how to make these choices. And then you're ready. 
So I, I want to move on to Bloomreach, uh, you know, a, an incredible company. And I can't believe, you know, when I'm even reading this, that, that you're p- helping power brands that are representing 25% of the retail e-commerce in the U.S. and the U.K. But, but before that, a personal question for me, because I'm, I'm just fascinated by this. You're on the Council for Player Development for the U.S. Tennis Association. And, yeah. you know, as an amateur player myself and follower of almost every tennis match that's happening, well, what, how do you even get to that? Why do you do that? Yes, you know, so tennis was actually a big part of my life growing up in, in you know, when I was, uh, I grew up in the, in the Philippines, I grew up in Southeast Asia, and uh, I played a lot of tennis, you know, growing up. And then eventually, when I got to college, you know, I didn't get any kind of scholarship, but I was able to walk on and play with the team, you know, at the very bottom of the team, I would say, you know, for, for the, the years that I was at Princeton. So it was a very big part of my mental makeup. And I actually believe that tennis and entre- tennis has actually been the best preparation for entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship is fundamentally wow. a problem solving, lonely sport. And that is exactly what tennis is. Um, and so. You know, later on in life, uh, as, as I've had the good fortune of building companies and, and being out here, you know, I got to know the leadership of the player development, uh, effort here in the U S. And if you know much about American tennis, what you'll conclude is the women are doing great and the men are doing terribly, basically, you know, and for <laughs> 20 years, there hasn't been a grand slam champion. And so there's a group that's come together to try to change that. And it's, it's always been a passion of mine. And so I was glad to be able to contribute, you know, to help, uh, support that mission. Incredible, incredible. So co-founder and CEO of Bloomreach, third entrepreneurial experience, definitely, I'm sure not the last one, but, but, but the current one, which is making a significant, significant impact in the e-commerce space. Bloomreach, what is that about? Yeah, so Bloomreach, I started Bloomreach now over 10 years ago, and the thesis was that AI and machine learning technology was being applied at that time by Google and Facebook, mostly for advertising. But no one I, I knew was excited about going online because they were interested in ads. You're interested in experiences. You're interested in shopping right. and buying and meeting and reading and all of these sorts of things. And so my initial insight was, let's use that class of technology to make every website, every app in the world amazing for end users. And in so doing, drive a lot of revenue for the brands that are publishing those experiences in that process. And we we honed in on e-commerce quite early on. And e-commerce became, it became very clear that that you can't manually curate an e-commerce site when you've got thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of products and hundreds of thousands or millions of customers. It's a grand matching problem that only algorithms can play a role in 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 mapping. And that's really what got us started with Bloomreach. And so today, you know, now fast forward 10 plus years, Bloomreach is all about driving growth for e-commerce companies. And it's our central thesis that the way you do that is you either engage more customers to your brand, and we have an engagement offering that does that. You inspire and educate them with great content about your products and services. And then once they've decided to buy, you help them find the right product really fast. And so we have a discovery offering that helps make that happen. And when these three things come together, they drive revenue for e-commerce brands, you know, up and to the right. And we've had the good fortune of working with 750 of them that lead on our platform to make that happen. Incredible. Now, you, you don't settle just to, to run a startup in the e-commerce space. You actually proceed to try and become a domain expert in the space, right? right? In fact, write a book about it, right? That's right. You know, and, th- and there's a story behind that, which is that sort of after doing this, after Bloomreach, and I'm also a seed stage investor in 20 or 25 startups uh, through my efforts, I would always get the question from, uh, from folks that's, that, that would say, why do the winners win in e-commerce and in digital? And why do the losers lose? And so this book, which is called The Digital Seeker, and it's now out you know, on Amazon, or you can go to bloomreach.com and find it, is my attempt to answer that question. And, and what I found that was fascinating was that great e-commerce experiences, great digital businesses, they build for the seeker, not the customer. And that's a little bit counterintuitive because we've heard about customer-centric marketing or customer centricity now for many, many years. So what exactly who right. exactly is this mythical seeker? And and the seeker is the why behind the customer. And so to use an example, you know, I might be a customer of plywood. I want some plywood because I'm looking to build a deck. And so, you know, when I go to the home goods store, I'll be looking for plywood, or then maybe I'll be looking for nails and hammers and other tools. Then maybe I'll I'll be looking for paint or whatever the set of materials are. So I'm a customer of a paint company, a plywood company, you know, a construction materials company, but I'm a seeker of 
a great place to host barbecues for my friends. And so the seeker is the person behind the customer. And really what we do is we translate our underlying motivations into a, to, into a digital to-do list. And then we become a, a customer of 10 possible companies. And it turns out if you actually build digital experiences for the underlying motivation, that's actually how you win big in digital. And so in category after category, and we can talk about a number of examples in healthcare, in, in travel, in uh, transportation, the winners end up building you know, for the seeker and not the customer. Right. And so how does one make that transition? Because it's not trivial. You're essentially adding an additional layer. It's like, in, you know, moving from two dimensional to three dimensional. You're adding, you know, an exponential amount of complexity to the equation and understanding. How do you even go about trying to make that transition? It's, it's, um, it starts with asking a lot of why. So let's, let's use an, a, an example we all know, like Uber. Uber didn't say, how do I build a smarter taxi? They said, well, what is it that the person is really seeking? And they concluded the person is seeking getting from point A to point B in a predictable fashion with deterministic pricing, you know, and a good car, you know, in a predictable time frame. And so Uber doesn't define itself as a taxi company, it defines itself as a transportation company that gets you from point A to point B. And so in thinking about that, they then had to invest in mapping software, in payments, in drivers, in marketplaces in reviews, a whole series of things. But to start with, you have to have the insight about what the seeker is seeking, and data plays a key role in that. As you watch what people are clicking on, what they're buying, what they're engaging with, you can, you can understand what they're really seeking, and you couple that with qualitative evaluations, and you'll get to the root of the motivation. And then from that motivation, that's when great technology and uh, a great sort of organizational structure and business model come together, and then you build these moats. You know, and what what I what, what I'll leave people with on this topic that I think is really interesting is, you know, I've seen Bayern Munich do this in soccer. I've seen the National Health Service in the UK do this in healthcare. I've seen Stitch Fix do this in fashion. This is not a story of Silicon Valley startups. This is a story that any business that's looking to win in digital can ask that question. I've seen uh, an, an amusement park do this really effectively to compete against Disney World. And so you can you can apply this the seeker-centric thinking really to any domain. Now, from a leadership perspective, you know, it, it's one thing to have that, you know, that that understanding. And it sounds to me like it's not just a, you know, a textbook playbook of, of how to go about asking these questions. You have to both be curious, but you also have to really be intentional in, in seeking for, for that, those seeking questions. How do you now as a leader help both your people at Bloomridge, but also the, the companies that you invest in help ask those questions, but truly intentionally seek for the answers and not just do a checkbox here. We found the answers from our customers. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think a good test, and there actually is a test in, in the book where you can ask, how do you build a seeker centric business? A lot of it is asking, you know, continuing to ask yourself whether you're delivering the full experience that that individual is looking for or just a small part, you know, of that. Because in a very crowded internet, if you're just delivering a very small part, it's very easy for them to switch from point A to point B. So you know, you've arrived at a seeker centric experience when it's very hard for a competitor to compete with you because you've marshaled all kinds of things. So as a leader, it's really asking the, the usual hard questions. You know, what is, why is somebody interested in our product? What are we uniquely offering, you know, to them that, that is different? Who within our organization is chartered with assembling that experience is critical as well. It's, it's a different formation of team, you know, in terms of, of how you set that up. So there's a number of critical questions I think you can ask to get there. Right. And I think from, from a naive perspective, it sounds to me like one of the biggest challenges here is that you're actually asking for people to go beyond just the, just the initial success. So it's not enough for me to get people to go on my website and buy my product because to me, for, or maybe for a lot of people, that would be that, that's the end result. That, that's the success. But you're actually saying no. It's actually one step beyond that. And it's actually understanding why did they buy the product? Because otherwise you're, you're not going to stay for, for too long, perhaps. Right? That's right. You know, I mean, to, to use a simple financial metric, very often e-commerce businesses are focused focused on sales and maybe margin or profitability, but really we're moving to a world of lifetime value. So, you know, when Peloton sells you the Peloton, it's not done, right? They sell you the subscription after that. They're upselling you the packages after that. That is what e-commerce looks like in the future. It's the lifetime value of that, of that end user that you're optimizing for. 
Raj, 20 minutes honestly have never gone by so fast. Uh, this, is, this was just incredible. I have three short, fun questions that I want to get to know you better. So I'm just going to shoot them yeah. at you, and, and I'm curious to see the responses. Going back to middle school and high school, what, what would be a favorite subject of yours? Yeah, so I, I was always very interested in, in social studies and world history and uh, civics and things of that type. In fact, I got a degree later on in public policy in addition to engineering. And I was always very interested in those topics, but also, but also the connection between those topics and science and math. Amazing. And a, a role model, somebody that inspires you. You know, from a business perspective, I think I've always felt like the greatest business leader of our generation is Jeff Bezos. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is other people have built great companies, but retail is an incredibly low margin business, very hard. And so there's a reason why, you know, he registered relentless.com, because I think that's what it takes to build a, be a great entrepreneur is incredible perseverance and, and relentlessness. And I think that's what he's demonstrated over and over again. Amazing. And what are three words that you would use to describe yourself? You know, um, let, let me say my, what I tell my kids all the time is to Dada's never give up. And so I think persistence uh, is, is number one. Number two is, is strength. Uh, I think, you know, through adversity as an entrepreneur, that's something that I take a lot of pride in. And the third is straightforwardness to just be able to call it like it is. Raj, this was amazing. Thank you so, so much. Best of luck with Bloomreach. And I, I can't wait to continue getting inspiration and, and definitely reading the book. And it's just, thank you for these 20 minutes. This was just awesome. Thank you. Michael, it's been great. Thank you so much. 